Well, in Psalm 63, the psalmist encourages the saints of God. He says, O God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory, because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you. Our lips will praise the Lord this morning as we gather to uh, worship him. Well, good morning and a very warm welcome uh, to worship today. It is a beautiful day, isn't it? It's a lovely day. The sun is shining. It's a wonderful day and we'll have a great time praising and worshiping our wonderful God together. Well, I'm sure that many of you will be glad about this. Uh, perhaps not so much for others. Um, But guess what? The football season is back in full swing again, isn't it? Yep. Uh, There's plenty of footy on the TV right now. We've got the Scottish game, we've got the Champions League, the Europa League, and of course, we've got the English Premiership all receiving wall-to-wall coverage. Uh, At least in my house, (laughs) it's receiving wall-to-wall coverage. But anyhow, the reason that I mention this is in connection with a Daily Mail headline that I saw last week. It said, Brazilian Jesus has boosted Arsenal on and off the pitch. And then it stated in big bold letters, the angel Gabriel. Well, if you know your football, you will immediately recognize that it's not talking about the Lord. No, it is referencing... Uh, nor is it referencing actually one of the only the two angels in the Bible that are mentioned by name. But it's actually speaking about Arsenal's uh, summer signing from Man City, uh, the Brazilian player Gabriel Jesus. Uh, this Samba superstar got off to a flying start in his career, netting for the London club two goals in his home debut. And the article sang his praises before closing with this line. It said, with Jesus at their helm, Arsenal look to be going places. Well, the top of the league this morning as well, actually. But anyway, whether this is true for the Gunners or not remains to be seen. But what I can tell you today is that with Jesus, the true Jesus, at the helm of your life, directing your places, you will most definitely be blessed and you will be going places places. In Psalm 32 verse 8, the Lord God says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. I will advise you and watch over you. So let's ensure that Jesus is at the helm of our life, guiding and directing all that goes on this morning, shall we? Let's begin by singing together uh, hymn number 374 in our mission praise books. It will come up on the screen. Jesus, my Lord, will love me forever. We'll rise to sing.
couldn't think of a much better way to begin worship than to declare that you belong uh, to Jesus. And that Jesus, we, Jesus belongs to all of those who put their trust in him. It's a wonderful truth. Well, let's bow our heads together in prayer, shall we? Let's pray. Lord God, as we gather this morning in the knowledge that you love us, you care for us, and indeed you gave your very self that we might belong to you as ransomed, freed, and restored children of the living God. And so this day we present ourselves as one seeking your blessing. We desire to develop as Christians, to be strengthened by your word, to be replenished by your spirit, and to be encouraged in the gospel of grace that is freely given to all who would hear and respond. And Heavenly Father, we do thank you that our redemption does not depend on our deserving or meriting of your love. And we know that if such a thing were true, then no one would ever be saved, that the gates of heaven would be closed, and that the blessings of the new creation would be unseen by human eyes. We realize, Lord, that all that we bring to the cross is our sorrow, sin, and shame, and that salvation is not a reward for the righteous, rather it is a gift for the helpless. So, Father, we praise you that before the foundations of the world were laid, you did select a people for yourself. We thank you that in the heavenly courts you did resolve to save your church through the atoning work done Jesus. So Lord God, as ones who know this marvelous salvation, we present ourselves confessing and repenting of all that would grieve your heart. We're all too aware of our failings. We know that we are far from the kingdom people that we ought to be. Yet we also lay claim to the merciful promises of restoration and forgiveness. So Holy Spirit, we plead once more that you would enable a time of worship that is acceptable for your purposes. And we plead that eyes would be opened, that ears would be unstopped, and that hearts would be receptive. Speak, O Lord, your children are listening. Hear our prayers, dear God, for we bring them to you this morning in the words that your own dear son, Jesus, taught his church to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, in the, the U.S. state of Arkansas, it is illegal to honk your car horn after 9 p.m. near an establishment that sells sandwiches. In Redbroth Beach, Delaware, whispering in church is punishable by law. If you were visiting Gainesville in Georgia, then you'd be wary if you fancied fried chicken for lunch. You want to know why? Well, an ordinance passed in 1961 made it illegal to eat fried chicken in Gainesville with a knife or a fork. Only fingers are allowed. Now, the list of bizarre laws continues. In Pennsylvania, it's illegal to feed your cat less than once a day. And in Alabama, it's against the law to drive blindfolded. Hang on. Does that mean it is okay to drive blindfolded when you're not in Alabama? Anyhow, in Arizona, it is illegal for a donkey to sleep in a bath. In Connecticut, a pickle must be able to bounce. And it is forbidden in Hawaii to put a coin in your ear. Quite why a pickle needs to bounce, or what would inspire you to want to put a coin in your ear, I'm not sure. But there are some bizarre, odd, and downright weird laws on the statue books, aren't there? Folks, God's laws are not weird or odd. In fact, God's laws 
provide the basis on which civilized society rests. And today we shall discover why Yahweh called his people to attention around Mount Sinai, why the press conference, if you like, in the desert. You see, it's like this. Yahweh is about to give his people, the Hebrews, his laws, his rules and regulations to order this new nation state. Now, he'll give them all manner of laws. Some will be in terms of how they're to worship him. Some have to do with how they regulate society, business, crime, and the like. But first of all, God will give Moses what we know today as the moral law of God, the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. Now, it's likely that if you are of a certain generation, your familiarity with the Ten Commandments will not be shared by the younger folks. In prior times, most people knew the Ten Commandments, and this is no longer true. Today, only 15% of Britons can name all 10. In the 11 to 16 age group, this 28% uh, of them don't know one. Now, as if that isn't bad enough, many who do know them, do know the Ten Commandments, want to change them, or at least some of them. A YouGov poll in 2017 found most Brits think that only six of the ten are still important. 93% thought that murder was still a bad thing. Lying was still frowned upon by 87%, and 73% figured that adultery should still be avoided. I wonder, can you identify the common thread that links the commands that folks want to jettison? It's fairly easy. You see, the laws that people suggest replacing are the ones that relate to honoring God. Worship God alone, don't make idols, don't take the Lord's name in vain, have a day set aside as holy for God, the Sabbath. There is a craving in the heart of man to separate the lawgiver from his laws, to zip God out of the picture so that we can make it up as we go along. Indeed, a few years ago, the computer games company, Electronic Arts, carved a new Ten Commandments, and they presented them to the Houses of Parliament. And the list included stuff like protect the planet and respect diversity of race and sexuality. Now, folks, as we encounter the Ten Commandments, we do note that they are no longer valued in our society. A few years ago, Ted Turner, the chairman of CNN, declared the Ten Commandments are outdated. He said, I bet nobody here even pays any attention to them. He says, they're too old. Commandments are out. And Turner proposed 10 voluntary initiatives to replace them. Friends, I don't think Turner is on the right track here. Indeed, I would suggest that society suffers greatly when God's commands are zipped out of the picture. Okay, so what are these commands? Well, let's read now from Exodus chapter 20. God's people had been redeemed from slavery in Egypt. They were now a new nation in the desert, and the Lord spoke to the Hebrews from Mount Sinai, chapter 20 of Exodus. And God spoke all of these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day 
as a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. We'll end our reading there this morning. We'll we'll sing before we uh, begin to look at God's giving of the Decalogue. We're going to stand again and sing uh, Mission Praise number three, Abba, Father. We'll rise to sing. Okay, quick quiz question as we start thinking about the Bible's laws. Here we go. Ready? Are Christians subject to all of God's laws in Scripture? What do you think? Hands up if yes. Hands up if no. Hands up if no idea. Okay, this is an important question. As Christians, people may ask us, what's the deal with the Bible's rules? Why do Christians keep some of God's rules, things like adultery and killing, but ignore the stuff about wearing clothes of two kinds of materials, about eating shellfish, and having your hair cut in a certain way? Now today, before we get into the Ten Commandments, we need to address this issue. 
And this is going to be fairly intense teaching this morning. You need to switch on if you take notes of it, do it. I make no apologies for this. You see, to witness faithfully, truthfully, and lovingly to people, we need to offer an answer to this question about which laws in the Bible apply today and which do not. I'm going to work through an example of this later. So here's the groundwork. Reformed theology asserts that there are three types of law in the Old Testament. There's the civil law, the ceremonial law, and the moral law. In his institutes, Calvin writes, of the division which distributes the whole law of God, the moral, the ceremonial, and the judicial law. Francis Turretin, who was one of Calvin's successors at Geneva, said this. He said, the law given by Moses is divided into three species. Moral, teaching of morals and perpetual duties towards God and our neighbor. Ceremonial, of the ceremonies of rites observed under the Old Testament. And civil, constituting the civil government of the Hebrews. So let's get this bedded in at the outset. There are three types of law in the Bible. Civil, ceremonial, and moral laws. So first of all, civil law. What is this? How do I recognize it? Well, the civil law concerns itself with things like criminal codes, business regulations, and rules given to the nation of Israel. Here's an example. In Exodus 22, verse 1, it says, If a man steals an ox or a sheep and kills it or sells it, he shall repay five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. And these civil laws are found in Leviticus, Exodus, Deuteronomy, and Numbers. And they're given to Moses after the Ten Commandments. They include laws about things like debt, divorce, inheritance, property redemption. There's also laws detailing punishment for murder, manslaughter, robbery, extortion, lying in court. And we also find regulations covering things like use of scales in commerce and instruction concerning warfare. God gave these laws to the nation state of Israel. The Westminster Confession labels the civil law judicial laws which expired with the state of that people, not obligating any other now. So basically, these laws regulated Israel, which was then, but is no longer, the particular people of God. Now, there is surely wisdom in the civil law, but it is not applicable to any nation today. The civic law is set up to govern the freed nation of Hebrew slaves no longer applies to us. Yes, they do still speak of God's character. They still reveal God's heart. But these laws, civil laws, do not apply to Christians. Paul doesn't enforce them. And the letter from the Jerusalem Council, which details how New Testament believers are to live, is silent on these precepts. So that's the civil law. And the second category of Old Testament law is the ceremonial law. An example of this would be Leviticus 1, verse 3 to 5. If a man is offering a burnt offering from the herd, he shall offer a male without blemish. And the Westminster Confession calls the ceremonial law ordinances partly of worship prefiguring Christ. So the sacrifices the cleanliness code, the observing of Jewish feast days, this is ceremonial law, and they foreshadow, they point forward to Jesus. Now, as Christ has come and given himself as a true sacrifice, these laws are fulfilled. The ceremonial law, although it does help us understand Jesus and his mission, is a shadow that is set aside when the reality comes. So it is not applicable to Christians. So folks, let's sum up where we've been. Civil laws, things like rules about how you treat slaves, punishment for letting your ox gore someone's cow, that is not applicable to us today. 
We are subject as Christians to the civil law of the UK, not ancient Israel. And secondly, the ceremonial law, stuff about what animals we shall sacrifice and what garments the priests will wear, not binding on Christians today. We don't sacrifice any animals anymore, thankfully. We don't approach God through a priestly intermediary. Why? Well, because we have the true once and for all sacrifice of Christ and we approach God the Father through the great high priest who is his son, Jesus. Okay? So we've got that. Now on to the third category. The moral law of God, the Ten Commandments. Now folks, here's the difference between the civil, ceremonial, and moral law. All the Ten Commandments, with the exception of the Sabbath, are repeated by Jesus to New Testament believers. So these laws apply to us today. These are forever binding. The Westminster Confession says the moral law doth forever bind all to the obedience thereof. Okay, so let's get this straight. Let's get this bedded in. Civil law, laws governing the nation state of Israel, things about punishment for crime, laws about inheritance, slavery, warfare, etc., not applicable to Christians today. Why? Well, because we don't live in Israel in the times before Jesus. Secondly, ceremonial laws, laws about ritual cleanliness, animal sacrifice, approaching God's temple or tabernacle, similarly not applicable to Christians today. Why? Well, because the object that is pointed forward to, the true Lamb of God, the perfect sacrifice, has come. Jesus has fulfilled the ceremonial law. The moral law, however, that is to say the Ten Commandments, are still relevant for believers today. And we know this. How? Well, because they are repeated in New Testament times. Now, you might think, well, you know, this is just a, a, an academic exercise. It's not. Believers need to understand this. And let me show you why. A few years ago, there was this notable scene in the, the TV show, The West Wing. Uh, 11 million viewers watched as a liberal, enlightened, progressive president gave what one might call a beatdown to a Christian conservative radio talk show host. Now, we're going to watch this together, and then, because in the few minutes that have just passed, I have given you the ammunition to respond to President Josiah Bartlett's ignorant tirade. So think about this as you watch this. You know, with so many people participating in the political and social debate through call-in shows, it's a good idea to be reminded every once in a while. <clears throat> It's a, good idea it's a good idea to be reminded of the awesome impact. The awesome, the awesome impact. impact. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, you're, Dr. you're Dr. Jenna Jacobs, Jenna Jacobs, right? Jacobs right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's good to have it's you. Good to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. The awesome impact, the awesome impact of the airwaves, of the airwaves and, how and how that translates into the furthering, the furthering of, our of our national discussions, but obviously but also, also how, it can, how it can. How it can. How it can. Forgive me. Forgive Dr. me, Dr. Jacobs. Are you an MD? Are you an MD? A PhD. A PhD. A PhD. A PhD. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Psychology. Psychology. No, sir. No, sir. Theology. Theology. No. no. Social work. Social work. I have a PhD. I have a PhD in English literature. I'm asking. I'm asking because on your show people call in for advice and you go by, you the, go name, by the name Dr. Jacobs, Dr. Jacobs on your show and. I didn't know if, didn't maybe, know if your maybe your listeners, listeners were confused by that, by that and assumed you had advanced, you had advanced training, training in psychology, psychology, theology, or health I don't, I don't believe they are confused, no, sir. No, sir. Good. Good. I like your show. I like, your show. I like, how, you I like how you call homosexuality, homosexuality an abomination. 
I don't say homosexuality, I don't say homosexuality is an abomination, Mr. President. Mr. President. The, Bible the Bible does. Yes, it does. Leviticus. Leviticus. 1822. Chapter and verse. I wanted to ask you, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions while I had you here. I'm interested in, I'm interested selling, in selling my youngest daughter, daughter into slavery, a sanction Exodus in Exodus 21.7. 21, She's a Georgetown sophomore, sophomore speaks, speaks fluent Italian, 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 always cleared the table when it was her turn. What would a good, what would a good price for her be? While thinking, While about, thinking that, about that, can I ask another? My chief of, My staff, chief of staff, Leo McGarry, McGarry insists on, insist on working on the Sabbath. On the Sabbath. Exodus, Exodus 35, 35 2, 2 clearly says, clearly says he, should he should be put to death. Am I morally, Am I morally obligated, obligated, to obligated to kill him myself, or is it okay, or is it okay to call the police? police? Here's, one Here's one that's really important, because we've, we've got a lot of sports fans, fans in this town. Touching the skin, Touching the skin of, a of a dead pig makes one unclean. Leviticus 11.7. If they, promise, if they to promise to wear gloves, can the Washington Redskins still, still play football? Can Notre Dame? Can, Notre Dame? can, West, can Point? West Point? Does the whole, Does the whole town really have, have to be together to stone my brother John for planting, for planting different, different crops side by side? side, by side? Can, I burn can I burn my mother in a small family gathering for wearing garments made from two different threads? Think about those, Think about those questions, would you? Questions, would you? One, last One last thing. Well, you may, well, be, you may be mistaking this for your monthly meeting, monthly meeting of the ignorant, ignorant tight-ass tight club. In this building, in this building when the president stands, stands nobody, sits. nobody sits. There you go. Ignorant Christian, huh? Okay, so how would you respond to that? Bury your head, shrug your shoulders, run out the door? What do you think? Well, let me give you an example, drawing on what we've just learned about the Bible's laws. Mr. President, my apologies for not standing. Paul in Romans encourages Christians to honor those in political authority, and I am remiss for not affording you the respect that your office demands. That being said, Mr. President, as far as I can ascertain, you are also not a doctor of theology or a scholar in biblical theology. Although your scripture memorization is impressive, it's clear that you have not understood the verses you quoted in the context of the biblical narrative. You see, every example you gave, aside for the one labeling same-sex activity an abomination in the eyes of God, is a civil regulation given to the nation-state of Israel in the 15th century B.C., these Old Testament regulations were made for a specific moment in Israel's history and are not prescriptive for all time. These laws, both civil and ceremonial, were provided to equip the Hebrews to survive in the harsh context of the ancient Near East. To tease that out further, the purpose of these laws were to protect Israel's capacity to worship God, to keep God's covenant people separate from their pagan neighbor's influence, to teach Israel about human sin and divine holiness, and to point to the messianic deliverer whom God would send in the future. None of these laws you quoted apply to the Christian. We do not live in an ancient Near Eastern theocracy called Israel, nor are we anticipating a Messiah sacrifice. You see, he has already come. He died on a hill in Golgotha for, amongst others, the very sin that you and your culture get particularly animated about. Mr. President, as a Christian, I know that these Old Testament laws were both a survival measure for God's people in a hostile environment in terms of civil laws and a foreshadowing of the fulfillment of godly worship as the ceremonial laws and regulations. These laws were preparatory for something better, and as such, do not bind the follower of Jesus. However, sir, the moral law of God, which includes adultery, that is to say, all sexual relations outside of marriage, which Jesus himself references during his ministry, does 
And as, biblically speaking, marriage is between a man and a woman, this would necessarily include all forms of same-sex relationships. This is why, as a Christian, I can legitimately and lovingly, for those conflicted in this area, affirm the sinfulness of same-sex relationships and at the same time not find myself compelled to burn my mother on her funeral pyre or stone to death a Sabbath breaker. And yes, sir, should I wish to play American football with a pigskin, we can do that as well. I pray that this would address your question, Mr. President. Folks, you see how this is no abstract area of theology we've been looking at. Our world has questions. And if you are a Christian, you need to be able to answer these questions. You know, this week there's been more teaching than preaching, that's certain. But believe me, the full weight of God's moral law, the Ten Commandments, and the conviction of sin and the impetus towards refuge in Christ it brings shall stir our hearts in these coming weeks. Let's pray together. Our God and Father, we confess that many times as believers, as followers of you, we are ill-equipped or ill-concerned even to answer the objections of a hostile and alien land. Lord, there are many within uh, this world who would seek to ridicule your church, who would seek to categorize Christians who follow you, Lord, as hypocrites, Lord. And unless we equip ourselves to answer their objections, Lord, they will never come to understand the love that we would have for all who are outside the covenant of God, all who as yet are headed on a broad road to description, all who need to hear that they are sinners in need of a Savior. So, Lord, we pray that within this church we would be a people so concerned for the redemption and salvation of the lost that we would do our homework, that we would equip ourselves to lovingly speak into a culture that needs to hear the gospel message, that we would stand up when confronted, that we would be strong in the faith, that we would be secure in our knowledge of you as revealed to us through your Holy Scriptures. So, Lord, we plead that in the power of your Holy Spirit, you would strengthen each and every head bowed here this morning, that we would know that you are a God who, who cares for us and a God who loves us, and a God who will supply all of our need, even that need of learning and studying that, which can sometimes be difficult. Lord Jesus, hear our prayers. Amen. Okay, we're going to sing uh, once more as we close a, a lovely song about salvation. We're, we have heard a joyful sound, Jesus saves. We'll rise to sing, shall we?
is actually where uh, this, this, this morning. I uh, try to work through it chronologically. Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, midweek Bible study prayer meeting. Thursday, 4 o'clock, the prayer group for the schools is being held in the Butte Hall at 4 o'clock on Thursday, the 1st of September. And on Thursday, we have a deacon's meeting at 7.30 p.m. as well. So that's this week, midweek Bible study, Thursday prayer meeting for schools at 4 o'clock, deacons meeting Thursday evening at 7.30. In addition to this, uh, Tuesday the 6th of September, the ladies Bible study uh, meet. Uh, Tuesday the 13th of September, the ladies fellowship will meet. This is an open night, the first night, which means Guys can go as well to the ladies' fellowship, and this you will be able to hear the Ayrshire ukulele band. Is it George Formby that used to? Was it George Formby? Ayrshire ukulele band. So that's Tuesday, the 13th of September. Ayrshire ukulele band, ladies' fellowship, men welcome also, but it's a new time of 7:30. Almost forgot. BB starts as well. BB begins on Monday. Coming Monday, 5th of September, Anchor Boys, which is primary 2 and 3, 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. Junior section, primaries 4, 5, and 6, 7.15 to 8.30. You're in the junior section now? Mm -hmm. And company section on Tuesday, the 6th of September, from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. If you can remember that, you're doing well. If not, thankfully, this is all on Facebook, and you can watch it again later. Well, these are all the announcements for this morning. Let's pray together, shall we? And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen.